Okay, so today we're going to um, start working in chapter two, and actually I'm going to try to cover as much of chapter two, uh, if, if not all of it, uh, today, okay? So chapter two is all about kind of displaying our data. Uh, it's, it's under this uh, umbrella of descriptive statistics. Chapter 2, part of descriptive statistics, and specifically, it's all about displaying our data. Okay. And so we can start off talking about displaying you know, categorical data or numeric data. Okay. And so in our, in our textbook, um, we start off with... Uh, you know, summarizing and describing numeric variables with uh, with displays. Okay, so we've got graphic displays. And we'll start off with for numeric data. Okay. And so, um, you know, uh, a basic one is uh, is called the dot plot. With a dot plot, you uh, you know, to create it, you uh, start with a number line, and then all you do is put a dot for uh, for each observation. Okay. Dot plots. These are these are best for smaller data sets. Okay, and so let's say I don't know you you have a family. Five children. And we'll look at their ages. And we'll say um, the ages are 1, 1, 2, 4, and 15. Okay, so they got five kids. I don't know, we can make up a backstory for, uh, for what happened. And, and then we're just going to create a number line. So I got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, so, so on and so forth. And all we do is we just say, okay, I'm going to put a dot at 1. I've got another child at 1. So we've got a dot at 1, 1, a dot at 2, and a dot at 4. Okay? And then we'll also put a dot right here at Fifteen. Okay, and so with a dot plot, you know, by uh, by putting the uh, the dots on the graph like this, this kind of gives us a, a sense of where the data is, and you know about how spread out the data might be. Okay, so it provides. So we might have a you can create a, a a larger you know another dot plot for maybe a, a larger set of data. OK. 
okay? And, you know, I'm just making, making stuff up. I'm not even sure what this data set would represent. So here's a here's another dot plot maybe um, okay. just making some up. And with something like this, uh, again, this this gives us a sense of okay, you know, values like uh, zero one one and four five six seven are you know a little bit more common values like two and three for whatever reason, are less common. Um, I, I don't know what, what this is representing. I'm just making it up. And so um, what we could um, do is uh, there's another type of plot. You can imagine if we have a, an even larger data set. Okay, You would have hundreds or possibly more dots. And it might, just, it might not be a practical way to, uh, to display the data. And so what we can do is we can go from a dot plot. So over here we've got a dot plot. And we can go to a histogram. And with a histogram, all we do is we just, um, I'm going to go ahead and just copy this number line down here. Okay. And instead of um, dots, we create a, a vertical axis that represents the frequency. Just say okay. Well, how many how many dots do we have over here? Let me, let me just count them up. I've got six in this column. Four, three, two, one, two, three, four, five, five, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, and one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. And so over here, I'm going to create a a bar that is six units high. Over here is a bar that is four units high. Here's a bar that's three units high. A bar that is two. And then I go up back up to what is this five? So now it's the same data represented as a histogram, okay? Okay, uh, but now now with bars rather than dots. Okay. Well, at this point, it might feel like, well, why would we even bother with? Um, with this if, they, if it just represents the exact same data. Well, the thing with a histogram is we can kind of group, uh, create bins or groups of values, okay? So if you had a, a really large data set that, let's say, spans, so you know, our, our data set, you know, it spans values from 0 to 7, 
But let's say you had a data set that spanned the values uh, 0 to 1,000. Okay? You don't want to have a, like 1,000 different bars across the bottom. Okay? With a dot plot, you would have basically 1,000 tick marks, 0 through 1,000. Each tick mark might have a dot, and probably many of these tick marks would not have any dots. Okay? With a histogram, you wouldn't want to um, just translate it directly like, like we did here, where you have um, you know, one bar for 0, a bar for 1, a bar for 2, and so on and so forth. Instead, you would probably create bins. Okay? And with the bin, we would group together certain values, okay? And so our bin might be uh, zero. I'm going to put a square bracket here and a curved brace or parentheses over there. And this means um, zero up to, so we'll say from zero up to, but not including three. And then we'll go from 3 to 6, OK? And this will be from 3 to, but not including, 6. Or did I do that wrong? Yeah, that's fine. Wait, 0, yeah, OK. And so 0, so zero but up to and not including 3 would be er the values 0, 1, and 2. Okay, and so I would say, okay, how many, how many numbers do I have in between zero and up to, but not including three? I would go, okay, I got six, I got four, I've got three, I have a total of thirteen values. So I would say, okay, what is the frequency here? Thirteen. And I go three through six, so I got three, four, five, so that's two, five, five. I've got twelve there, and then the last one, I would go six through. 9 and 7 and 6 I have, or 6 and 7 and I have 13. And if I had 8, the number 8, that would get included there as well. And so with, um, we can bin this, okay? And so if you had values from 0 through 1,000, you might create bins from like 0 to 50, 51 to, um, you know, 100, and then, you know, 101 to 150, and 151 to 200, so on and so forth, you might group 50 values together so you don't have to have a thousand different bars, but you know, maybe only 20 bars or something like that. Okay, and then so, you know, you, representing the same data that we have here, suddenly my histogram looks uh, you know, a lot more um, meager. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, thirteen. Okay. Fourteen, fifteen. So that would be the fifteen. Okay. And ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I don't histogram uh, after I've binned them together. Yes, question? Um, for the histogram that's on the upper right corner, uh -huh. uh, why do you write the number in the middle of each? Yeah, okay, why don't, why don't I write the number in the middle? Yeah, so the, the histogram, it's kind of based on this idea that uh, all of these bars represent kind of bins and and so technically, this bar right here is 0 up to but not including 1. Okay? And so there's, it's, even though, you know, with a discrete variable where you can only have whole numbers, you're only going to have 0 and 1 and 2 and things like that. And you don't have things like 1.7 or 1.9. But when we represent them with a histogram, each bar, this bar, kind of goes represents the idea from 0 up to, but not including 1. So that just means the value is 0. Okay? But if there were decimal values, it would include 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.9, and things like that. 
Okay, and so that's why it's not centered at zero, but the left edge starts at zero. And then this next bar that starts at one, you know, this bar represents values starting at one, going up to, but not including two. All right, same thing here. Values starting at zero, going up to, but not including three. Values starting at three, going up to, but not including six. Values starting at six, going up to, but not including nine. Okay. So that's kind of the, the stylistic uh, idea there. OK. Um, The, uh, the book mentions uh, something called a stem plot. Uh, to be honest, I don't think stem plots really appear very often outside of textbooks. So I think it's OK for me to kind of skip over the topic. Uh, and you can, I'll, I'll leave it to you in your reading to, uh, to, to read over it. But, um, but here I want to talk about um, shapes of distributions. OK, so I'm just going to say. Um, Read about stem plots. Okay, I will skip. All right, but now um, we'll talk about shapes of <coughs> distributions. Okay. And so a lot of times, when we're talking about a numeric variable, we talk about the distribution of the data. Okay? So when talking about a numeric variable, we often talk about the distribution of the data. The idea of the distribution here is how are the values distributed along the number line? Okay. How are the values in our data set or in our sample distributed al along the number line? Are they all kind of clumped together in one zone? Are they spread out far across? Um, these are the kinds of, uh, kinds of things. And we, we might go so far as to talk about the shape. Actually, we often talk about the shape. And so you know, we can say, so I'm going to give you um, kind of these, quote, archetypes, these character archetypes of shapes of distributions. In reality, distributions of data, actual data sets, will never have this, um, quote, picture perfect um, shape, OK? Uh, but I'm going to give you kind of like, this is the, uh, the picture perfect idea of what, what some data shape might look like, OK? So imagine we've created a histogram. So uh, here the histogram looks So if this is our histogram, we might, in order so I don't have to keep drawing all of these bars, I might just say, OK, well, the overall shape <coughs> looks something like this, OK? So you know, over here is the histogram. Here's just a, a curve 
to, to get the sense of the shape of our data. Okay. Keep in mind the variable under, underlying this histogram is a, is a numeric variable. Okay, so underlying our histogram are you know, many observations of a numeric variable. And, you know, because the height of each bar represents, you know, how frequently that value shows up, these bars represent kind of values in the middle. These are most frequent. Okay. And then values out here, these are less frequent because these bars are short, right? Most frequent, the tall bars. Less frequent, short bars. Okay. Same thing over here. All right. The exact exact same thing. We would call. Um, so keep in mind, this is also you know, the number line. So we've got low values and high values. Again, low values down here, high values up here. And so this just means values near the middle are most frequent. Values out here are less frequent. We would say, we would describe this thing as being unimodal and symmetric. I'm going to just copy this onto the uh, the next slide so I have more space to uh, to talk about it. You know, if you have room in your notes, you don't have to redraw the thing. Okay. So again, this is uh, this means unimodal and symmetric. And so I'm assuming you guys, at some point in your education, you talked about different types of average. You've got the mean, the median, and the mode. Right? Okay. And the mode represents what? the most common value observed, all right? And so this idea of unimodal means there is one location that is most common. The most uh, common values, right? Uni and modal, OK? So one location that has the, uh, the most common values, and that, that is right here. So uh, another way of thinking about unimodal is that it has one peak. One peak in the distribution. Okay, the idea of being symmetric, symmetric means that the extreme values on the high side are about as common as the extreme values on the low side. Okay, So basically, the extreme values, we will call these tails. And symmetric means you know, extreme values on the high side about as common as the extreme values on the low side. <coughs> and so, you know, you know, things like um, You know, um, IQ scores is generally thought to look unimodal and symmetric. Okay, 
I mean, there's there's a lot there's a lot of debate as to whether IQ scores are are valid or not, or even SAT scores. Okay, and the, you know, also debate are how valid are SAT scores. But the idea being that you know most scores, most people score kind of in the middle, right? So most scores, whether we're talking about IQ scores or SAT scores, most scores are in the middle. Okay, and then, and once you get over a certain point, you get fewer and fewer and fewer at these extreme high regions, right? So you have very few scores. You do have some, but you have, you know, fewer values that are extremely high. And likewise, you also have very few values, few values that are extremely low. Okay. So as far as you know, the distribution of something like IQ scores, we have that um, human height also. Generally, um, things related to the skeleton, okay, so human height and, uh, you know, skeletal measures, uh, things like that. This would be a unimodal symmetric. A lot of things out in nature are unimodal and symmetric, so if you look at animal sizes, right, like how big is, at least things in the wild, okay, generally unimodal and symmetric. Um, once things become domesticated, then, then they generally tend to right skew. Um, OK? So we have this. Are we good here? So that was symmetric. We might have other uh, distributions that maybe uh, something like this, okay? And so this, we would still say is unimodal, okay? There's still only one peak, but out here, our tail is out here, and we would say this is right skewed. Okay. Right skewed, if, if you need help remembering uh, whether this should be called right skewed or left skewed or whatever, um, just imagine if you had to skewer something, like if you were going to use this shape to stab some meat or something, you would use the right side to do the skewering. Um, and the idea here is that, you know, kind of most of our, our values are down here, okay? Kind of most values down here, most values are here. And we have some values that are extremely high. <coughs> There's not a lot, but there are some that are extremely high. But on the other hand, if we go over here, we have no values that are extremely low. Oh, and I, you guys can't see that. Basically, uh, on this side, we have no values, is, is basically what, I'm, what I've written there. And so an example of something like this would be a income, okay? Income distributions. All right, and so, I don't know, if we looked at household income uh, in the United States, most households make between, we'll say, zero and $150,000 a year, okay? That's gonna cover most, most households. Um, are there households, and are there households that make a uh, million dollars a year? More than that? Yeah, okay? So we got, you know, most, most everyone between zero and 150,000, 
And you know, the average is probably something around 65,000 or 60 to 65,000, something like that, um, the median being. But you know, just for simplicity, just so we have nice even numbers, let's say the average is $100,000. OK, it's not, but uh, it's, it's lower than that. So if we're looking at um, you know, a household that makes 100,000, and we call that, quote, average, and we're, we look at a household that makes uh, you know, a, a million dollars, so I guess uh, on the picture it's, it's over here, then, then that household that makes a million dollars is you know, 900,000 over, quote, average. Okay? Can you go 900,000 below average? Now, 900,000 below average takes you to negative 800,000 a year, and you cannot have a household income of, of negative money. Right? Um, at least being, you know, being paid a wage of negative money. Perhaps you get, you know, I don't know, some kind of debt crisis here. But um, you, know, you, you can't have negative income. And so therefore, there's going to be a hard limit in terms of the values that you see. You're not going to see values lower than 0. Okay? And whereas your average might be over here, and then you, you have some values that are extremely high. Okay? So income, we have. Most values will say 0 to 150,000. Okay, and then we'll say um, you can have very high values like 1 million, possibly even you know 100 million. Okay, there probably aren't too many households that make 100 million, but there might be. Okay. Um, and so th these are crazy high, versus uh, you're going to have you know no values below zero. So this would be uh, an indication of something that is uh, is right skewed. Um, so if that's right skewed, then what would the uh, the flip side be? Okay, the flip would be. something like this, and we would call this left skewed, right? And left skewed would be something like maybe scores on an easy exam. Okay. And so with an easy exam, probably a lot of people will score, you know, 90, 100, 80, 80, 90, 100. Okay, easy exam. You're, you're not going to go over 100 because that's the highest you can get on the test. And, you know, but even if the exam is easy, you know, if you give it to enough people, you're going to get some people who score, you know, 30% or 40% or something, um, you know, much lower than everyone else. Whoops. Um, and so that would be something that's left skewed, okay? Where you know most everyone is up here, but you know you have some observations down on the low side. Whoops, I didn't want to do that. Okay. And so that uh, talks about kind of the shapes of distributions that we might see for numeric variables, and uh, and so let's talk about categorical variables. And so, you know, let's um, let's say we go to uh, I don't know one of these parking structures, and we decide to look at uh, the different cars that that are parked there, and we're going to collect some categorical uh, information about the uh, the cars that are parked there. Okay, so so we will um, pretend. We've gathered some categorical data. Okay, and so we'll say, you know, we're looking at cars and the parking structure.
and we will say, you know, what, I guess what region is the, uh, the manufacturer from, right? So we'll say, uh, you know, what the variable that we'll collect is the, uh, the company region or company, I don't know, country slash region. So broadly speaking, we'll say, um, okay, so this will be our observation, and then this will be the, um, we'll call it the origin. All right, and so, you know, maybe you have car one, and car one is a Ford, so we will say this is, a, is an American car. And then maybe car two is a, a Honda, so we'll say it's a Japanese car. And then car three maybe is, I don't know, BMW, so we'll say it's Europe. You know, instead of Japan, let's just do um, Asia. Okay, and then, you know, that way we can get um, Hyundai and Kia, and, you know, so. So if, you, if it's a Toyota, if it's a Honda, if it's, you know, and I, and I realize that cars aren't, cars are manufactured globally, like a, a lot of GM vehicles are manufactured in South America, but we'll say, you know, the, the parent company is headquartered in the U.S., so we'll, we'll say it's an American car, okay? And so we've got USA, Asia, Europe, and are there other types? We'll, we'll just have a, a, an other just in case, okay? But... I don't know if there are, I don't know where the other ones are, but uh, okay. And then so you go through and then you just, uh, you know, you keep, uh, you keep a tally and, and I don't know, let's say there's two, uh, 200 cars. Okay. And so we will, uh, we'll summarize this with a frequency table. Are there any Canadian manufacturers? I don't. I don't know. And if, if I know Russia makes cars, and would they be Europe or Asia? Um, okay. Yeah. So Russia is always the. That one's not classified as easily, right? All right. Okay. And then so we'll say. Um, we summarize this, we've got USA, Asia, Europe, and we'll, we'll have the other, just in case. All right, so I don't know, I'm making stuff up here. Um, 65, 100, uh, 106, I don't know, how many does that leave? So then here now we have uh, 200 now, okay, if, if I added these up correctly. Okay, and then we would um, then graph this over here. So other, there's only one, so this bar is really tiny. Uh, USA goes up to uh, 65. Asia goes up to 106.
here it goes up to Okay, and so this this is our bar chart. <clears throat> so all we do is just summarize our raw data into a frequency table, and then we take the frequency table and we we make bars that tall. And I think that's straightforward enough. You guys can can do that. Um, all right, um, as, as far as talking about uh, bar charts, the arrangement of bar charts, the arrangement of the bars in the bar charts is arbitrary, okay? So over here, this is our, our bar chart, and, uh, and this is, it's fine. Let me, um, don't, don't redraw this just yet. So this is what our bar chart currently looks like. But if someone wanted to say, you know what, I want to put the bars in um, in order from least to uh, from tallest to shortest, and do this, right? So they they take the bars and they rearrange them. So now it looks like this. Okay, this is totally valid. Okay, the arrangement of the bars is arbitrary. So if you wanted to say, you know, I want to put them in tallest to shortest, that's fine. If you want to say, I want to go from in alphabetical order, also find uh, the arrangement of bars is arbitrary. Whereas if we go back to the histogram, okay, I am not allowed to rearrange the bars, okay, because the arrangement of the bars for the histogram is tied to the number line, okay. So you can't just say, oh, I feel like moving the number seven so that it goes between the numbers three and four, okay. You're not allowed to do that. Um, so for for the histogram. The arrangement of bars is, is tied to the number line, whereas with a bar chart, the arrangement is arbitrary. If you want to say, oh, I feel like putting USA between Europe and Asia, you know, at least on the bar chart, that, that's allowed. Okay. Let's talk about, um, you know, variation that we might see in a categorical variable. And the idea of variation is if, if a set of data has high variation, or let's, if a set of data has low variation, then that means most of the values you see are similar to each other. Okay, So um, low variation, this means most of the values in the sample in your data set are similar to each other. Okay? And on the other hand, high variation, this means most of the values or the values are yeah, most of the values are different from each other. And so, you know, let's say we went um, to two different uh, parking lots, okay? And uh, and we just said, okay, so we went to um, I don't know in different parts of the country, okay? So we'll say parking lot A, and we looked at the uh, the origin, 
and we'll say again we'll, we'll have USA, Asia, and Europe. And we'll just keep it simple. So we'll say over here, as far as the frequency, we had 32, 33, and 34. Okay, does that? And then over here in uh, parking lot B, we look at the, uh, the origin, USA, Asia, Europe, and the frequency, let's say it's 93 and 7. So, so if we create a, a bar chart for this, you know, it's going to look something like this. Here, our bar chart would look something like okay, so we'll have this we'll look like this. Okay, and the question is, which data set has more variation? Data set A or data set B? So who thinks B has more variation? Okay, and who thinks A has more variation? Okay, well, the answer is A has more variation, okay? So A has more variation. Why is that? All right, now most of you guys picked, picked B, okay? So A has more variation. So you, you, you look at this and you're like, well, 32, 33, and 35, those all look similar. But those are not the values in the sample. What are the values in the sample? The values in the sample are, is the categorical variable that under, is underneath everything, right? So. If, you, uh, if you're standing in parking lot A and you're looking around, you're going to see all sorts of different cars. You've got uh, American cars, Asian cars, European cars. Okay? So we say, um, so that has high, higher variation. Okay? Whereas if you go to parking lot B and you look around, all you see are American cars. Okay? And so this will have, has lower variation. So we're talking about the underlying variable. And if, if one category is highly dominant over everything else, there is, um, there's less variation, OK? Um, you know, um, when, uh, when the internet first got started, there were all these different companies, and, and your, your email address could have been, uh, you know, so-and-so at AOL, so-and-so at, I don't know, like CompuServe, and there's like Net Zero and all these different tiny little companies. And you had a great variety of different um, email address types, okay? Uh, today, pretty much there's only, what, Gmail and maybe... Um, Outlook, okay, and uh, does anyone, I don't know, Yahoo Mail? I don't know, know if anyone still uses Yahoo or um, what, iCloud or something, I don't know, all right? Th there's not a whole lot of, as, of email providers anymore, okay? And so, you know, we went from a place that had high variation where none of the categories were dominant to a situation where there's much less variation, okay? 
All right, we'll, uh, we'll end here. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you guys uh, next week. Next week, we're going to start using clickers, so make sure you have a clicker and bring that on Monday.